But um, Shaylin's book, Upswing, How We Came Together a Century Ago and How We Can Do It Again, um, is uh, co-authored, actually, by Professor Robert Putnam, who's on the American Promise Advisory Council and the renowned sociologist, author of Bowling Alone and other classic books that go to the heart of some of America's biggest societal and, and democratic challenges. Um, I'll introduce Shaylin more fully soon, but as usual in this series, we're going to check in with you all um, on some of the key progress over the past quarter. And I don't have to tell you about uh, the situation um, in this world and in this country. Events are volatile, terrible challenges. Um, but amidst that, uh, as in prior times of crisis, division, war, and challenge, uh, there is great opportunity for we, the people, to step in. And that's what all of you do. And we are enormously grateful as we at American Promise together are on track to unite Americans to fix some of the biggest threats um, to our society and preserve the promise of freedom and democracy when we need it most. So welcome. As, as those of you on the, on the call from American Promise know, but I want to say again, because we are delighted to welcome any new people who joined us after seeing it uh, promoted on social media or otherwise, uh, we at American Promise are uniting Americans in a cross-partisan, non-partisan citizens movement to pass and ratify the For Our Freedom constitutional amendment. It'll stop systemic corruption, stop the donor class driven division and dysfunction and put power where it belongs with all the people, all the citizens across America with limits and regulation of money in politics. Um, so uh, for my quick report, I have three main things I wanted to share with you. Um, we've generated number one, we've generated and we are holding massive cross-partisan support. If you didn't see it, we just released some polling that will identify this. Um, we now have super majorities of Americans, Republicans, Democrats, and independents who agree that the number one threat to American democracy is money in politics. Um, higher than political violence, higher than the challenges of elections, money in politics, I think Americans get that we have core uh, problems and symptomatic problems um, that also are very serious, uh, but money in politics now identified number one threat and among the highest of our national priorities, ahead of immigration, ahead of crime, uh, ahead of climate. And again, I think that's not because Americans don't care about those other things, but they see and we see the frustration of trying to solve those things. Um, with the systemic corruption. So we did some polling, again, uh, nonpartisan experts at Citizen Data, you might have seen it, um, happened to be released the same month as a comprehensive Pew Research survey, both affirming and showing that between 75 and 80% of Americans, Republicans, Democrats, and independents agree with us that we must pass a constitutional amendment, they support it, to limit money in politics. Um, we'll be tracking internal state polling as we make decisions about state campaigns going forward. And that gets me to number two. We are expanding. We are growing. You know that. And we're rolling out a big expansion of our tested state-based strategy. Constitutional amendments aren't easy. Um, we learned, as um, Shay Lynn will share from her story and her book, Americans have uh, regularly figured out how to do big, big reform. And that's what we're doing. We're using the tested three-pronged strategy of all successful amendments and big reforms from the Bill of Rights to voting rights, that's leveraging state wins that create conditions in the states and in communities for a winning vote in Congress, rapid ratification back in the states. So 22 states now ready to ratify. We'll be adding many more states soon. Quick highlights. Maine, did you know foreign government controlled entities spent $100 million in Maine elections in just the last three years? foreign government controlled, 100% owned, foreign government owned corporations. $100 million in three years to influence Maine's elections. Hundreds of volunteers in Maine have got, uh, got the signatures of 80,000 Maine voters. It'll be on the ballot November 7th. And we're looking to see what Maine voters do with that. Um, we are um, optimistic, thanks to the tremendous work of our team and volunteers there. 
It'll put, when um, we win that, it'll put teeth behind Maine's early for our Freedom Amendment resolution, one of the 22, and prohibit election spending in Maine by foreign government influenced entities. Pennsylvania, um, our team and volunteers finishing up just today, a two-day citizen lobby effort in Harrisburg, met, meeting with legislators, uh, delivering a new report uh, that uh, perhaps Alan can put in the chat, um, a link. And why don't you put a link to the For Our Freedom Amendment too, Alan, while we're at it. Um, but a link to a report we just released about money in Pennsylvania um, and building support where we hope to announce soon cross-partisan introduction in the House and Senate there of a leg uh, legislative resolution that could make, we, we intend to make Pennsylvania the 23rd state to get behind the amendment. Similar efforts in Wisconsin, um, thanks to many of you and you know from Wisconsin and know that um, citizen lobby meetings went on there, meeting with uh, Congressman Derek Van Orden's team, um, other um, critical work and endorsements as in Pennsylvania, Arizona now expanding. Uh, Brian Boyle, our executive director, hit the stage at the Center for Constitutional Change at Arizona State University, uh, debating and discussing uh, with uh, the Goldwater Institute uh, in Arizona about this constitutional amendment, uh, bringing a lot more Arizona voters continue to come to our cause. And we're seeing that across across uh, uh, across the country. And I see many of the volunteers across the country on this call, uh, many of whom actually submitted on Constitution Day last month, uh, letters to the editor and op-eds about uh, our constitutional reform. So thank you so much for for all of that. Um, finally, number three of the quick report and last, and then we're going to get to uh, our special guest tonight, uh, but we're just back, as I mentioned at the top, from the American Democracy Summit in Los Angeles. For those who were there, you know, it was incredible. A thousand citizen leaders, dozens of leading reform organizations, connecting, coordinating state and national civic reform, constitutional strategies, um, and civic renewal. There's some links to some reels. Uh, don't watch them now. Pay attention here to <laughs> Shaylin's about to share some news we have to use, but check out the reels um, with some highlights uh, from that. And uh, we'll share after the call a, a recap on LinkedIn. If you're there from Maya Cook, you might have met those who were there, those who didn't. Keep an eye on her, a student at Yale um, who was on the panel with New York Times columnist and editorial board member Jesse Wegman, me, a, a lawyer from the Brennan Center, and she was undaunted and uh, and did a tremendous job. Maybe Maya's on the call. If so, thank you, Maya. So just some quick feedback. I was blown away. This is the feedback we received. I was blown away. You've organized a wonderful cross-section of people, and it's inspiring. Another one, I've admired your strategy and effort for many years now. I deeply thank you for your persistent efforts to get this important change to the U.S. Constitution. Another one, it is really impressive, both in what you do and how you do it. Um, two more, encouraging some real progress and some promising new ideas. And then um, finally, I can't thank you enough. It was wonderful. I had some great conversations. I share those because they go out to all of you who've worked so hard and have stuck with this uh, for so long. Our, our moment is um, clearly coming with the kind of cycles of amendment errors we've talked about before. And with that, I want to um, transition to our special guest uh, because one of those amendment eras that our strategy is betting on and that happened about every 50 years, one of the most profound was a century ago. Uh, amid global war, economic volatility, massive immigration and racism, a deadly pandemic, deep divisions, and violence, Americans united rallied uh, to pass and ratify no fewer than four constitutional amendments in the space of a decade. Um, one of these, the 18th Amendment with prohibition might have been a little much. Uh, we fixed that with another amendment, but another uh, three amendments between 1913 and 1920 were a big part of uh, the positive mega trend that Shay Lynn and her co-author uh, describe in the book. The 19th Amendment won women the right to vote. The 17th Amendment forced senators to face election by the people and broke the monopoly corporation's stranglehold on, on our Congress and on the Senate. And then the 16th Amendment overturned a Supreme Court case and allowed a progressive income tax 
with ramifications that carried through the 20th century. Shailene Romney Garrett traces this arc back a century and forward uh, to the crisis of today and upswing how Americans came together a century ago and how we can do it again. She is the co-author, as I said, um, with Professor Robert Putnam on our advisory council. And this book has been proclaimed, acclaimed as magnificent and visionary and a must read for those who wonder how we can reclaim our nation's promise. Um, Shailen's other writing um, also includes revealing portraits of religious communities across the United States in American grace, how religion divides and unites us. And she is a winner of the Princeton University, that book, um, the Woodrow Wilson Award for best political science book. Um, Shailen's a passionate believer, uh, and I know this will resonate with American Promise uh, folks on the call, that everyday interactions are where we do the heart work is required to transform a hyper-individualistic culture and reclaim the power of we. Her work has appeared at numerous outlets, Time Magazine, New York Times, BBC Radio, Harvard Business Review, and elsewhere. So um, I will add uh, that Shay Lynn has served in the Peace Corps, and she's a permaculturist who loves to get her hands in the dirt and thinks a lot about healthy soil as a model for thriving communities. Shailen Romney Garrett, uh, welcome to the call. Thank you so much for your work and for joining us tonight. And I'm gonna turn it over to you because I know you have a fascinating presentation to share with the group right now. So the floor is yours and thank you again. Thank you, Jeff. That was a really um, kind and thorough introduction and I really appreciate the opportunity to be here. And I have to say, I speak to a lot of audiences and um, not all of them are as hopeful <laughs> or can lay claim to as much hope as this group can, uh, mostly because of the incredible work that you are doing, which Jeff um, very adeptly uh, pointed out the parallels to the work that you were doing to a previous era in American history. Um, but before we get to that hopeful part of my story, <laughs> I'm gonna start us off um, in a different place. I'm gonna start us off with where we are today. And I wanna start my discussion today um, with just the motivating question behind the research of the upswing, which is basically, how did we get here? So if we can go to the first slide here, um, none of this is gonna come as a shock to those of you who are so active in trying to change the course of American history and American democracy right now. But let's go through this just uh, just for fun, just in case uh, any of this is news to you. America today has reached historic levels of political polarization. Um, almost at no other time in our history have the parties been so unable to cooperate um, on basically anything. Um, generally speaking, that political polarization extends to the general populace, although you have, have um, hit upon the one or two issues upon which almost everyone seems to be able to agree, which is incredible. Um, but really, even as we're seeing uh, the drama that's unfolding in the House of Representatives right now, we're now experiencing polarization, not just between the parties, but within the parties, right? Where the parties themselves can't even agree on what it is that they're trying to accomplish. So there has been um, almost no other time in American history as politically polarized, statistically speaking, with the exception of the American Civil War. But that's not our only problem. We have also reached historic levels of economic inequality. We are now more unequal than at almost any other time in our history. But that's not our only problem. We are also more socially isolated than we have been at almost any other time in our history. So in addition to this political polarization, this economic inequality and the social isolation that we are experiencing, we are also experiencing historic levels of cultural self-centeredness. We are an incredibly narcissistic culture and that's not just a qualitative statement, that is something that we can actually measure and have done so. We are extremely narcissistic as a society in terms of our cultural values. So we are facing as we all know too well, a perfect storm. And the question really is, how did we get here? Now, Bob and I are not the first um, commentators or researchers or scholars to ask this question. 
In fact, one of the early reviewers of the upswing um, noted that this is just yet another addition to the how America got into this mess genre of literature, which has been in development for over a decade now um, with really a lot of a lot of smart people trying to figure out how it is that we got here. And a lot of great um, commentary and discoveries have been you know, put forward. But one thing that I think makes the upswing unique is that we're not just focused on one of these lenses on American civil, uh, American society. We're not just looking at the politics. We're not just looking at economics. We're not just looking at our social capital or our culture. We're looking at the confluence of all of those things together. And the other thing that makes the study of the um, that and the data that you'll find in the upswing different is that we're not just looking at the last half century. A lot of narratives asking how we got here are narratives trying to account for the precipitous decline that has taken place over the last 50 years um, in all of these different areas of our society. But the upswing zooms out a little bit further, looking not just at the last half century, but actually at the last 125 years in American history, trying to get a broader lens, a broader view on what is going on here and how we got here and how we might be able to get out of this historic mess that we're in. So what I wanna do is just wanna take some time to quickly, and, and it's quickly, I'm gonna walk you through some data from the book. And the reason that I do this is because it's pretty breathtaking data. So I know that not everybody on this call is gonna be a numbers person. I personally am not the numbers person in the team between Bob Putnam and Shailen Romney Garrett. Um, he's the world-class data scientist, I am the storyteller. And so uh, my strength is making sense of the numbers, but I do wanna to present to you um, the statistical story that really forms the backbone of, of the message of the upswing. So what we're going to do is we're going to go through each of these different lenses on our society, again, looking at a 125 year time span. We're going to look at politics, economics, society, and culture, and see what the trends over time have been. In what direction have we been moving at different moments in this 125 year span? So let's go to the next slide and start with political polarization. Now, what you're gonna see here is a graph charting political comity. Now that's not a phrase that we generally hear used. Um, it may be among this group, I don't know. Uh, you might know that term, but it is basically the opposite of political polarization. And the reason that this is a this graph depicts political comity is that in all the graphs that you're gonna see, up is better. So up means progress, right? Up means that we're moving away from polarization and toward comity, right? And you'll notice that there is no, um, there is no indicator on the y-axis of what we're looking at here. And this is because this is a compendium graph that uh, summarizes scores of different measures of political polarization, puts them all together, right? And that's why it's a general measure of political comity versus polarization. You'll also note that on the, on the x-axis, we have here the time horizon. This, this data starts in about the 1890s and, and it goes all the way up to um, about the, the 2000 teens. Um, but, if, but we also know that if we were to extend that graph into today, um, it would plunge even further than what you see here. So let's go over basically what the, the basic um, shape of this graph is. As you can see back in the 1890s, during a period um, in America's history called the Gilded Age, America was extremely politically polarized. Politics were very tribal. Um, there was basically no agreement. Often there was a physical fighting over politics in the streets, right? We saw extreme measures of political polarization, not only in, and again, this graph takes in, into consideration not just what's happening in Congress, not just whether or not, you know, senators are voting on bills sponsored by um, somebody from the other party, but also the feelings that Americans, the average Americans have toward members of a different party. So we call that affective polarization, right? So this is lots of different measures of polarization. You can see that we were extremely polarized during the Gilded Age, but that we began to pull out of it. And slowly over the course of the next 70 years, we become less and less politically polarized, more and more able to cooperate in the public square until we get to that 1950s era, um, which is characterized by one of the, well, probably the least um, um, polarized president in American history with the exception of George Washington. And that was Dwight Eisenhower, right? A candidate who was essentially um, being put up by both parties, you know, uh, someone who he, he he wasn't the cause of this great sort of political cooperative moment, but he epitomized it, right? 
And we were in that politically cooperative moment where it was often difficult to distinguish between the two parties because there was so much overlap between what they were working toward. And we stay there for a while until the mid-1960s. And as you can see, things start to move rapidly in the opposite direction. And as I mentioned, as we um, as we extend the data to today, we, we would see that this graph plunges even further. Um, we are now at a point where it's almost statistically impossible to be more polarized than we are now. So that's the graph over 125 years of political polarization in this country. Now let's look at a different lens, change the lens on society. We're gonna go to the next graph. In this graph, we're looking at economics. Again, up is better. So up means that we're getting more and more economically equal. Down means that we're getting more and more unequal. Um, again, we have a similar time trajectory here. You can see that the data start here in roughly 1913. And that's because that's when the IRS began collecting. Basically, that was when um, the national income tax was established. And so that's when we began collecting good longitudinal data about um, income inequality. But um, using other data sets, we also know that that if we were to look before 1913, that it, we were actually more unequal um, in the years previous to this as well. So here you can see a similar story, right? We were extremely unequal uh, in the late 1800s, early 1900s, but that began to change. We have a pause in the 1920s, which is um, what historians call the roaring 20s. And that was the time when the stock market boomed and the rich got a lot richer and the poor didn't get any richer. And so we saw um, a dip in our move toward equality, but quickly that resumes and we have this sharp rise in equality. And in the 1950s, in that mid-century moment, um, we actually see that America was about as economically equal as the um, Scandinavian countries who are famed for their in income equality, economic equality. And of course there were rich and poor in this nation. There was, um, there was no absolute equality, um, but we became at this moment closer than ever before to our goal of being um, a nation where all are created equal and we have equal opportunity for all, right? But we can see that in the 1960s, that story begins to reverse itself and everything begins to unravel. And again, if we were to extend this data to today, um, per particularly post-pandemic, we would see, a uh, again, a dramatic downward descent into even further inequality than we're seeing on this graph. So we have, again, that start off really unequal, get much more equal, but then it all falls apart again and we get unequal again. All right, let's change the lens. And we're going to go to the next graph. And now we're going to look at social cohesion. Um, that's kind of a fancy word for another term that you might know called social capital, which basically just describes how connected we are to one another, how much we attend meetings, join clubs, attend church. This even includes um, measures of family formation, how likely we are to marry and to have children and to stay in our marriages, right? All of those forms of togetherness that, that create the social fabric of our society. And again, we have a similar time horizon here. And what you can see is in the 1890s, we're an extremely socially isolated nation. Um, people didn't join, people didn't participate. Civil society was not well knit together, but that began to change. And over the course of a 70 year trajectory, we saw significant improvement in how, how much our society came together, worked together. Again, we see that familiar pause in the 1920s, which is really interesting where our progress levels out, but then it picks up again in the 1940s and we see this huge boom in social capital. But in what should now be a familiar turning point in the mid 1960s, we see that everything turns in the opposite direction and what was getting better and better begins to get better, worse and worse. And again, post pandemic, if you can imagine extending that graph uh, past 2020, you can imagine where it lands today. All right, let's change the lens one more time. And now we're going to look at our culture. These are, these are about our cultural beliefs, our beliefs about what our society is all about. Is this one giant competition? It's every man for himself. Or is our society about coming together, what we can do together, how we can take care of the most vulnerable? What are the core cultural beliefs that define what we believe America is about? So this is cultural solidarity versus self-centeredness. And you can see that in the 1890s, in the Gilded Age, we were incredibly narcissistic, very self-centered society. But we turned it around. We got better and better. 
And interestingly, you see that familiar pause in the 1920s, but then everything gets more and more focused on solidarity, on what we can do together until about the 1960s when everything turns in the opposite direction. So um, these are four distinct lenses on American society. Each of the graphs that you have seen represents scores of underlying measures. So what you're looking at is you know, probably over a hundred different separate measures of American society over time. And when we put them all together, as we can see in the next graph, we can see an, an extraordinary degree of correlation in what these graphs look like. Now, again, I'm not a data scientist, um, <clears throat> but even I can see that it sort of hits you between the eyes that something is going on here, right? I can't emphasize enough how rare it is for this many different phenomena to track this similar of a trajectory over this long a period of time. In fact, these graphs are so correlated that using high level statistical methods, we can combine them all into a single graph. So if we go to the next slide, you can see that this graph provides a statistically validated summary of the course of American society over 125 years. And my co-author Bob Putnam and I have come to call this the I, we, I curve. Because all of those things that we talked about, income inequality, um, political polarization, social isolation, narcissism, right? Those are all things about being I focused, focused on what's in it for me and fighting against others, right? Versus a, a sense of we, a sense of wanting to work toward equality, wanting to work toward cooperation, wanting to work toward um, solidarity, right? And so what we can see is essentially that the 20th century in America was America's I, we, I century. We started off in an extremely I focused mode in multiple dimensions of our society. We moved distinctly and, and basically uninterruptedly with the exception of that small blip in the 1920s toward a more we society. But then we changed directions pretty abruptly um, and moved back in the direction of I. And so um, this is the story of how we got here from a statistical perspective, right? We can see that um, there's been a lot of change over time. And again, many of the studies that look at the question of how we got here really focus on this era of the downturn, the last half of the 20th century, right? they tend to focus on a fall from grace narrative. And, um, and in a way, this is sort of, there's a lot of voices in America calling to make America great again, right? There's this sort of nostalgic, backward looking, let's get back to that golden era when everything was better than it is today. And I wanna emphasize that that's not the message of the upswing, nor is it the message that I want to share with you today. Um, what I want to share with you today, on the contrary, is that we believe, my co-author and I believe, that, um, sorry, I've lost my graph here, there we go. We believe that the moment that we most need to learn from today, in this moment of multifaceted crisis that we are in, the moment that we most need to learn from today is not some moment of supposed greatness or supposed golden era in our history, but rather the moment that most looked like the one we're living through today, because what we see in these graphs is that we've been here once before. It's easy to look around today and say, oh, things have never been worse, right? How could we possibly get out of this bind? There's no way that, that we've ever been in, the, in, in a moment this difficult. But the truth is, and what's so fascinating about this data is it shows we have been here once before. The Gilded Age looked strikingly, even breathtakingly similar to the moment in history that we are living through today. And just like today, during the Gilded Age, there were commentators and there were, um, you know, all sorts of analysts of our society decrying the end of democracy, declaring that all was lost, that, that the American experiment had failed, tyranny, oligarchy, right? These words that we hear sometimes thrown around today were also being thrown around during that time. But what this data shows so clearly is that on the contrary, con that none of those doomsday prophecies actually turned out to be true. 
On the contrary, we entered a multi-dimensional, multi-decade upswing that unfolded over the course of two thirds of the century, essentially pulling us up and out of that crisis and into a completely different version of America than what we could see when we were living through that first Gilded Age. And so this is a fundamentally hopeful narrative in the sense that, 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 that the upswing focuses on not the downturn, but the upswing, right? What happened during that last era? Who were the people? What were the ideas? What were the, the animating and motivating forces that really turned the tide and moved America in a better direction? Um, and so that's what I wanna spend the last little bit of my time talking with you about today. So on the heels of the Gilded Age, came a moment in American history called that historians call the progressive era. And it was really this progressive era that set in motion a sea change that helped us reclaim our nation's promise. And I wanna just make sure that, that we um, make a distinction briefly about the use of the word progressive. Um, as we hear the term progressive today, we use it in a way that I would call small p progressivism. We are today when we hear the word progressive, we are describing the leftmost end of the political spectrum, right? Um, on the contrary, when historians use the term progressive to describe this era in American history that I'm referencing, um, it, is, it is what I would call capital P progressivism, which wasn't about political ideology. It was actually a, a movement that historians have called so diverse as to be barely coherent. It was a movement made up of housewives and industrialists. It was made up of blacks and whites. It was made up of immigrants and it was made up of politicians. And all of these people who were united by essentially two things that they had in common. One was a compelling desire to repudiate this downward drift that our nation was in. And the other was a galvanizing belief in the power of ordinary citizens to do this. Now, these are things that should be familiar to you because you are already, all of you, involved in a movement that understands this and is capturing this sort of nonpartisan energy that we think is exactly what characterized the progressive era. So when we hear the word progressive, it's tempting to think, oh, this was sort of like a left-leaning movement. Um, and a lot of the reforms that ultimately came out of the progressive era later on in later decades are things that we tend to associate with that end of the political spectrum. But actually this was a very bipartisan, very diverse movement. So I just wanna make sure that that's clear. All right, let's go to the next slide. Because what I wanna talk about here today um, is again, what are some of the lessons? from the last upswing. If we want to create another upswing in American history, if we believe that that's possible, if we believe that we've been here once before and that we can do it once again, then what can we learn from America's last upswing? Now, the story that I've shared with you is fundamentally a statistical story. And so when you have so much data, particularly trend data, um, data that is tracking change over time, and you see that a lot of trends are moving in the same direction over a long period of time, one of the questions that you can ask is, um, what was the leading variable? So if I've got all these four different variables and they're all moving in the same direction about the same time, can we identify what was the leader? Which variable turned first? Because if, if we can identify what the leader was in all these different variables, we might be able to identify what the sort of silver bullet would be in terms of what pulled all the rest of these things forward. And we tend to have a bias in this um, country um, toward the idea that economics drives everything. And this really comes out of the social sciences, which largely have treated um, human beings as economic animals driven by incentives, right? And so there's often this sense that, oh, well, it must have been economics that, that led. If we, we fixed our economic system, our economic inequality began to abate, and suddenly that made people sort of feel more like they were included in it, and that we were all in this together, and that must have pulled all the rest of the things up. And what's so fascinating about the data is that it's very clear that this is not true, that economic equality is actually the clear lagging indicator. It is the thing that turned last, not first. Um, now, don't mishear this, right? I'm not saying that it's not important that we focus on fixing our economic inequality today. It's absolutely critical that we do so. We are living in an extraordinarily unequal um, 
immorally unequal time in, in our economic history. But what the lesson of history might be teaching us here is that there may be something underneath questions of economic policy that we need to get at changing first if we want to successfully change the shape of our economics in this country. So, so if we're asking the question, you know, which was the leading indicator? The answer is not economics. Economics was the lagging indicator. Well, so what was the leading indicator? It's a little bit hard to tell looking this far back in history with this many variables. But when we pair the data with the historical record, what emerges is a very clear picture that the leading variable was actually culture. And not just a cultural shift, but specifically a moral shift. A moral awakening is really what led the progressive era. When you look at the intellectual history of this period, the history of ideas and how they unfolded and how they got into the water system of American society, you can really see very early on, even as early as the 1870s and 1880s, um, at the very front end of the, the Gilded Age, um, you could see a call for a moral accounting for what was beginning to happen in society. And the real story of this is fascinating. I don't have time to share too much detail, but I just want to say briefly that actually the real originators of this moral shift uh, were, in fact, evangelical Protestants. They were preachers who essentially began to call Christians to account for not living their own religious values. They began to say um, things like, what would Jesus do? Actually, that phrase traces back to a best-selling novel that was written during this progressive era, asking Christians to reevaluate whether they were actually living the we values that Christianity supposedly professes, or whether they had fallen into the trap of living a hyper-individualistic version of their faith. I'm concerned about my salvation and the devil take the hindmost, right? And this reframing of our politics, of our broader social and economic and political landscape as moral questions um, spread quickly out of this social gospel movement, which is what this, these preachers were called, the social gospel, and into broader society. Um, and you really see, for example, the writings of Henry George, which really called for a moral rethinking of our economic system, for example. When you look at the leading progressives of the era, they were all really fundamentally influenced by some touch with these types of writings that reframed the problems um, as a question of right and wrong, right? And so we believe that if we're going to see another upswing today, it's not going to start with economics. It's probably going to start with a question of culture and morality, that we need to figure out how to do the heart work, the work underneath the policy work, underneath the political work that begins to shift who we think we are, how we see one another, and that out of those internal and cultural shifts will come the shifts in our policy and our politics that we're hoping to see. That's what happened last time. And I believe that that's what will happen if we wanna see another upswing today. Um, I do wanna save some time some, for questions, so I'm gonna move really quickly through the rest of these. Um, we do see very clearly that in the last upswing, grassroots innovation was the leader. When we think of the progressive era, if any of you are familiar with progressive era history, you might think of things like um, the passage of all of these national, uh, all of these constitutional amendments or the, um, the national income tax or the consumer protection agency or child labor legislation, all of these big top down reforms. But the real story of those reforms, as Jeff mentioned earlier, is that they actually started at the grassroots. The constitutional amendments were not passed by fiat from the top. They were passed because of victories that happened at the bottom that slowly bubbled up. And that was true not just of legislative change, not, not just true of constitutional change. It was true of um, programmatic change as well. But some of the most um, important shifts in American society, including things like free public high school for everyone, were not ideas that were floated at Harvard or in the halls of Congress. They were actually things that real Americans were experimenting with in their small communities um, that then showed success and, be, and sort of went viral and became models for the national reforms that then came on the very tail end of what we know as the progressive era. So grassroots innovation is going to be incredibly important. Real citizens solving real problems. And it's often easier to cross 
um, party lines, when you're talking about issues that affect that directly affect your family, it's hard to disagree that we all need a public park or we all need um, a, a new public high school. It's it's um, we are seeing that that people are finding ways to make those partisan issues, but it's harder to divorce. It, it's harder to infuse ideology into those conversations when we're talking about things that affect our day to day lives. And that was really the story of the last upswing. And I believe that it will be the story of this one as well. Um, this was a movement that was incredibly young. It was led by a group of people who were living in a completely different world than the one into which their parents were born. Does that sound familiar? Technologically, um, as far as the, the general organization of society, culturally, things had basically turned inside out. And the older generations were feeling very much at sea, like they couldn't get their feet on the ground. And young people came into that moment and said, this is the new world that we're going to live in. We have to come up with solutions for today. And most of the reformers that, um, that led the progressive era were under the age of 30 when they were doing their most important vital work to get this movement off the ground. And we believe that young people today did not create these problems. They did not create this multifaceted crisis that we're in, but they will be the ones who will build the solutions because they will have the innovative spirit that it will require to cut across these old sort of um, ossified ideas we have about what's possible in our nation politically and democratically. Um, just quickly, these progressives viewed association not just as a nice thing that we did, but as um, a means to what they were trying to accomplish. So um, we saw people essentially inventing new ways of people of bringing people together because all of the quilting bees and barn raisings and and you know small church meetings that were happening in the towns and and farming communities of a previous era were simply not going to cut it after the industrial revolution brings millions of people into cities. It's not going to cut it on the Lower East Side of New York to, to sort of um, do these old forms of bringing people together. And so we see a huge civic boom in terms of the invention of new ways to bring people together. And that created vast stores of social capital that actually fueled this upswing for decades. If you're familiar with the work of Bob Putnam, you know that social capital is not just window dressing on democracy, it is the actual lifeblood that fuels successful democracies. And so progressives made deliberate and enormous investments in actual association building across lines of difference in particular. That is something that we are going to have to invest in. We need to look to our young people for the innovative new ways of bringing people together in a changed world. So the last um, thought that I'll leave you with in terms of um, the lessons from the progressive era is, you know, I, I've gone over a lot of the positive lessons and the progressives truly did. I mean, it, the data doesn't lie, right? The data does not lie. The progressives essentially managed to turn America in a completely different direction, not just temporarily, but for 70 years. And not just in one or two aspects of our society, but basically across all different dimensions of our society, we were we started moving in a totally different direction than anyone expected during the Gilded Age. But they didn't do everything perfect. And by no means do we do we argue in this book that we should just sort of replicate everything that they did. Um, there were many cautionary tales that come out of the progressive era as well. I don't have time to go over all of them, but the biggest of which, of course, is that the we that these progressives was were building toward was simply not inclusive enough. In many ways, um, the needs of people of color and other uh, groups were just kicked down the road or sort of sacrificed on the altar of progress. It was like, we're gonna you know, create all this progress as a nation, but we're going to you know, keep it racialized because if we, if we go any further than that, we're not going to be able to accomplish these big things. And so in a way, the upswing had sort of knit into it the seeds of its own demise because um, white backlash to the civil rights movement turns out to be a huge part of the story of what triggered that downturn. And that was because we basically never did the work of truly achieving racial reconciliation, not just on a legislative level, but on a heart level, again, on that moral level, that was something that we never achieved during the progressive era. And we are seeing the bitter fruits of that even today. Um, so any upswing that we would hope to see or hope to bring about today has to take full inclusion as its absolute core value rather than something that we can just leave to the periphery once again.
So if we can just go to the last slide, I will leave you with this parting thought. Um, President Theodore Roosevelt, who we often think of as sort of the champion of the progressive era, the truth of his story is actually that he was a political entrepreneur. He sort of saw a parade and got out in front of it, right? The progressive era was well underway when Teddy Roosevelt became its sort of most articulate leader. And we needed, we, we absolutely need political entrepreneurs like this, but um, he was not the leader of it. It was actual everyday citizens who were doing the work on the ground that created the real energy of this movement. But he captured the ethos of it so well in these words. He said, the fundamental rule of our national life, the rule which underlies all others, is that on the whole and in the long run, we shall go up or down together. What the data that we present in the upswing proves is that when we pull together, we go up together. And when we pull apart, everything unravels. Um, in the words of my colleague, Eric Liu, who I love to quote, we all do better when we all do better. That's the very simple message of all of these scores of data sets over all of these many decades, is that when we lean into the power of we and believe that we are all in this together, we not only experience a kumbaya feeling, we also experience greater equality. We also experience measurable abilities to cooperate in the public square, that these things are inextricably tied together. And so again, this is a fundamentally hopeful message in the sense that we have been here once before. It has been this bad once before. We fixed it once before, we can do it again. Um, and, and you of course are already doing this work more so than me. I'm out here telling stories about it, trying to convince people that it's possible, but you are on the ground actually doing the work. And I take my hat off to you because you are building, you are the lifeblood of building this new movement that is nonpartisan, that transcends political ideologies, and that really takes as its core the questions of what, what is right and what we really want this society to be all about. So kudos to you. And thank you so much for inviting me to be a small part of this movement by presenting this message to you today. Um, and with that, I will turn the time back over to Jeff. Thank you. Wow, Shaylin, thank you so much. Um, really powerful message um, and um, so much important um, uh, aspects of it to unpack that we're not going to have time for, but I'm going to start. So you're not off the hook. Stay with us. Um, and uh, uh, please, folks, put if you have um, questions into the chat, I'll try to uh, work work them in. Um, but I want to start Shaylin, with um, something you said, I want to both underline it, but dig a little deeper. Um, the, the, the driving shifts were moral and cultural and grassroots innovation. Um, but I want to go back a step into, into what is shifting in some ways, because it, um, it seems to me that um, amidst all the data and the upswing um, are epic, epic struggles for power, right? Mm -hmm. You had basically a powerless many and a uber powerful few mm -hmm. running the country. And, and I think that is behind the data today as well. And the more, it seems to me, the moral and cultural questions, they start to ask those questions. It's no longer assumed that that's as it should be, but mm -hmm the moral challenge to that, like, that's just not bad policy. <laughs> you know, yeah. that's just not a bad set of Supreme Court cases. That is immoral, um, right. that, especially in this country where we are grounded on that we're all created equal. And and I say that because it's so relevant to our struggle about the the the, um, the acceptance and, and sanctification, really, that the Supreme Court gives the allocation of political power based on wealth. Right. And basically forces it on the country. And I think there's a lot of parallels to the what happened to the American overwhelming wish to have anti-corruption laws and limit political power. Because if we have actually a, a relatively equal political power where voters matter, a lot of the other policies will change, economic and others. And so I, I wanted to ask you about that because um, I think we're seeing the same thing now. We certainly see it at American Promise, where I think we have gone well beyond, you know, this is a campaign finance issue or kind of a wonky issue to that fundamental question of under the constitution, who has power and who doesn't. And mm -hmm. our view 
is we the people have power and we need to limit the power of economic concentrations of power so they don't become political concentrations of power. That's not the view of the Supreme Court. But if we, when we address it in, in that kind of way as a constitutional values driven issue, rather than a thousand page McCain-Feingold law or something, but a very fundamental constitutional question, we then get allies everywhere because you tell the story of Tom Johnson. And I wonder if you can share more about that because when you present it as a moral question, we all have to ask ourselves, is it right? And you may have a lot of economic power. You may be Republican, you may be Democratic, you may be something else. Um, you Things might be working for you, um, but that you can't live with that anymore. And you become allied to the change that says, well, because people don't tend to give up power that they have voluntarily until there's a moral issue. And then they have something better to think more about the we than the I. So I don't know if you want to share, like, you know, sometimes there can be an assumption that, oh, the powerful operators of super PACs and donors are never going to be with us. It's not been my experience. Many, many people want to change this because they don't think it's morally right. And that's what you tell the story of with Tom Johnson and many others, Theodore Roosevelt himself, as yeah. the elites who actually became allies. Yeah, I mean, I, I in um, the phrase I've sort of come up with to describe this is that that a huge chunk of the progressive era was peopled by chastened elites. Um, they were elites who had benefited from these unequal systems and benefited from this imbalance of power. And they sort of had this come to Jesus moment, right? And and we tell in the book so many of these stories, the story of Francis Perkins, actually. We think of Francis Perkins as the sort of champion of labor, right? Who was always on the right side of history. But Francis Perkins had this moment where she really thought she was just going to be a part of the New York establishment. And it was actually her witnessing the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire in New York City, when um, scores of young immigrant women who had been organizing and advocating for safer working conditions actually were burned alive, right, in front of her eyes. And she realized then that she couldn't just skim the cream off the top of this society anymore, that she had to get in the fray and change things. Um, another one was Tom Johnson, who you mentioned, who actually was sort of a rags to riches story. He was the son of a Confederate soldier who had lost everything in the war. And he was a self-made man. He basically built himself into a streetcar tycoon. Um, he not only owned uh, a controlling interest in the sort of streetcar industries in multiple cities, but then he began to buy up interests in steel and other things. So he was really flirting with that monopolistic tendency, right, that we saw during the Gilded Age. And he encounters the writings of Henry George. He was reading them on a train, uh, on a train ride from here to there, and it struck him so deeply um, that he began to see the economic system in which he was participating as immoral. And he has this enormous shift where then he goes on to um, be in municip municipal politics to regulate against uh, the, his former colleagues who he used to be you know, competing with to get the biggest piece of the pie. And then he becomes a regulator and introduces um, all sorts of reforms that curtail that power. Um, he also ends up spending his fortune promoting the ideas of Henry George and, and experimenting with different ways to, um, to reorganize the economy. And there are lots and lots of these stories. And in fact, my, one of my favorite pieces of the progressive movement was the Settlement House movement made famous by Jane Addams at Hull House. Because her fundamental realization, and this is something that actually came from the realization of other elites working in London uh, before Adams and, and her contemporaries, was that we had to put elites into direct relationship with the people who were being hurt by these systems. And if we could do that, then we could facilitate these heart changes in people. And that's exactly what the Settlement House movement did. It seems a little bit sort of... Um, out of date today, but the idea that that elites would come and settle in the slums in order to live side by side as neighbors with immigrants and people who were struggling. And when you trace the, the movers and shakers of the progressive era, this is actually what I wrote my thesis on as an undergraduate, you cha you, cha you um, trace those leaders almost, almost to a person. You can trace them back to experiences in the settlement house movement where they came into contact with others who were not like them and it totally changed their thinking about morality. Um, and so I think that those kinds of human person to person connections can actually create the kind of transformation that then changes a person's worldview. And if that person happens to be an elite, 
there's a lot of, there's a lot of outsized um, uh, results that can come from that. Right. Yeah, absolutely. I think it goes to another thing you said, the end and means, um, yeah. you know, I, I want to just lift up Marie Henselder Kimmel, Dr. Henselder Kimmel on our, uh, one of our great volunteer leaders has reminded us in the chat, we first came across you and she and other American Promise volunteers were at the uh, Mormon Women for Ethical Government Conference and, and learned about your work. And, and I say that because I think we have we have encountered many groups like that and like American Promise, where it's not just about outcomes, it's about how we actually relate with each other and connect with each other and communicate with each other and and learn from each other. And I and 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 one of the things you say is these associations. There are many, many formations of new associations. American Promise isn't the only one that didn't exist five years ago. <laughs> You're seeing this right. flour flourishing of Huge. associations again um, that I think is another promising data point. And we're kind of running out of time, but I wonder if you can close with that, um, what I see is a fairly hopeful um, indicator that we we are certainly doing our work, but we are far from alone and we may well be seeing another upswing. Yeah. Um, what I'm feeling sort of inspired to share with you is actually a quote from Washington Gladden, who was a uh, prime mover in the social gospel movement that identified that I identified earlier as these sort of early thinkers who were reframing problems as moral issues, because it's sometimes hard to say like, how do we talk about morality? That's such a third rail in American society today, right? So let me read for you what his formulation looked like. He said this, it is idle to imagine that changes in our governmental machinery or in the organization of our industries will bring us peace. The trouble lies deeper in our primary conceptions. What we have got to have if we want true democracy is a different kind of men and women. Men and women to whom duties are more than rights and service dearer than privilege. And I think that um, what inspires me the most is that I'm beginning to see this kind of a cultural shift in America, that, even, that movements like yours are not just focused on procedural, political, um, governmental machinery change, right? That you're actually asking people to ask themselves, what kind of democracy do we want? And what kind of a person do I need to be in order to show up for that kind of democracy? And I think that that's a hugely inspiring shift um, that it's taking us past questions of policy, questions of legislation. We saw with the civil rights movement that, you know, it was no surprise that we were able to pass landmark civil rights legislation at the peak of American we, right? And vast majorities of Americans were in support of the passage of that legislation. But then months, within months of the passage of civil rights legislation, public opinion completely turned and people said, not in my backyard. That was all fine in theory, but I don't really want to integrate. I don't really want to share the pie with those people, right? And so what we saw in that story was that legislative change was actually not enough. Um, and actually there's fascinating data, which we, which we detail in the upswing about what has happened since the civil rights movement that actually life has gotten, has stagnated or gotten worse. Um, from a, the perspective of material equality between blacks and whites since the civil rights movement, which is hard evidence that that just changing the laws isn't going to change things, that we have to change our hearts. And so I would encourage um, any of you out there who um, haven't thought of it in quite this way. There's a huge movement. Um, it's it's called lots of different things. It's called the dialogue across difference movement or the um, deliberative democracy movement. There's lots of different uh, things. Um, ways that people formulated, but it's basically the listen first movement, right? These ideas of bringing people into conversation with one another on a heart level, on a human level, and, and putting that association first um, can have enormously transformative power. It already is. And so we have to stay the course. We have to be brave enough to go below the head and into the heart in order to see the changes that are gonna be lasting in this society. Shailen, thank you so much for that inspirational, um, powerful, and um, we are um, in, indebted to you for coming to us this evening to share that.
Um, this will be, um, it was recorded. We will be sharing it. There's some requests in the chat for uh, the source of that quote, if you don't mind. Offline, sure. send that to yeah. us. And we'll include it in the recap with the other links. Okay. Um, and uh, you couldn't have said it any better, and I won't try to say it any better. Well, <laughs> head, heart, uh, body, and soul, let's do the work, everybody, and buy the book. It's really good. Tell your friends um, two things. Tell your friends about the book. Tell your friends about American Promise. They can sign up at AmericanPromise.net. The book is Upswing, um, and we'll follow up with a link to the Simon Schuster uh, page for Upswing where you can see where you can buy it. Shailene Romney Garrett, thank you so much. Thank and you, thanks. Jeff. It's been a pleasure. And, and, and it's our pleasure as well. And thanks for joining us. Uh, we will see you out uh, in the States and in the work and on our next quarterly leadership series, everybody. Thanks for joining us tonight. Bye-bye. Thanks.